uh, on the saddle road between Woodville and Palmerston North, and it's just not recovered. Uh, and each day, you know, it looks slightly worse than the day before. So today, the only part he walked was through the uh, three kilometres through the city of Wellington. All oh, right. At the right. end, right at the end. Congra- right at the end yeah. Congratulations, well done all, on all the money you've raised, uh, you've raised, and well done on the sheer dedication for so long to this cause. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Joe. And can people still donate? Just by the way, they still could. The website will be open for, until December, so yes, there's plenty of opportunity. Oh, to plenty donate. of opportunity. Very good. Uh, yeah. And any, anything else planned? By the way. Uh, not right Early now. stages yet, but yes, there is talk of raising money for schools in India next year by from a walk from the Golden Temple in Amritsar wow. through to the Taj Mahal in Agra. Okay, that'll be colourful. Well done. Okay, and thank, oh, yeah. congratulations, Mike. Good to, good to talk again, Mike Butler, on the panel. Before we go with you on Jock, I have to ask this um, animal rights activist aghast at a kindergarten planning to hold a possum and rabbit hunt to raise money. This is Ormond Kindergarten just north of Gisborne hosting the Father's Day Possum and Rabbit Hunt competition. Prizes for hunters with the most kills and the heaviest and the heaviest bag. Last year the competition raised $1,000 which went to the kindergarten but animal rights group Safe NZ wants the hunt cancelled saying it risks desensitising children to acts of violence towards animals. What do both of you think? Maybe I'll ask Nadine first. I am a little bit squeamish. I came home yesterday and my cat had a bird couldn't help but think of Gareth Morgan. He wears two bells and he'd still managed to catch a bird, so I felt a bit ill about that. But at the same time, I think we are at risk of being just a little bit too PC about this. I mean, they're pests. It's not as if they're they're killing family pets. No. Jock? Uh, This is a load of rubbish from these (laughs) um, animal welfare people, the SAFE, whatever they're called. You know, and look, I mean, hunting in this in this format has uh, been done for years. It's good. It's good fun. It does the country a lot of good. They're pests, as we all know. Also, too, it helps to um, introduce youngsters uh, into the sport of shooting, which is a very good uh, and generally safe sport. And I, I just think these people, you know, need to get a life. You know, goodness me. And also, too, uh, someone complained about, oh, you know, I heard a rabbit scream. Well, you know, one thing you learn in the hunting organisation is, you you know, one bullet, one kill, uh, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's good fun, it's in a good cause, and they should let these people at the, at the you know, at the kindy or whatever just get on with it and have a good day. Do you think you can link hunting, as I think SAFE has, to domestic violence? No. No Not connection whatsoever? I don't think so. They will try and make a connection. They will say, oh, well, the people who go out hunting are sort of great big hairy blokes with tattoos, they wear camouflage clothes, and they carry guns, and they've got big knives, and they come home, and they buddy beat up and molest their partners. I don't think that is true. I don't think there's any evidence that supports that. I think they're just trying to get a headline. OK. Any closing comment? No, other than I think I wholeheartedly agree with you, Jock. Um, I also think that it's the kids who are torturing animals that tend to have a correlation, wouldn't it, to adults who go on to have problems in later life? Yeah. Yep. You would want to see the research, as Jock's suggesting. Uh, Jock Anderson has been on the panel today. Thank you, Jock. Can I just say happy 65th, 65th birthday to Sandy Baxter? Sandy Baxter, happy 65th birthday from Jock. Nadine Higgins, uh, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me. Come back again, and we will be back again. Thanks, everybody, on Monday. uh, Checkpoint, coming right up with Sharon Brett Kelly. Kia ora everyone, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly and on behalf of our excellent team, Heidi Mai, welcome to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Tonight, a $60 million blowout laid bare as the Ministry of Health released the financial performance of the country's 20 DHBs for the latest financial year. The political knives are out. Last weekend, National announced it would rebuild Dunedin Hospital within seven to ten years. Today, the Labour Party announced it will start building the hospital in its first term if elected to government. A mother tells the court her son made the biggest mistake of his life when he took part in a violent robbery of a South Auckland supermarket and a Massachusetts mother quits her job after winning a billion dollar Powerball prize.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Batanaho. The Labour Party is confident it can build a new Dunedin hospital faster than the National Party if elected to government. The party says the $1.4 billion project could be paid out for could be paid out of existing taxpayer funds rather than the National Party's proposal for a public-private partnership or PPP. Labour's leader Jacinda Ardern says the build would start in the first term of a Labour-led government and she's confident it will be completed faster than National's seven to ten year plan. Simply by not having a PPP means we have much greater control over it. Uh, we also believe from the conversations that have been had locally that it is possible to deliver the hospital sooner. And Waipat is just our start time. The, our government isn't even committing to starting it in the next term. Jacinda Ardern says the Labour Party is also committing to build the hospital in the city centre. Some residents of Bulla on the west coast are fighting the development of a new healthcare centre which they say is not fit for purpose. The district's 35-bed hospital is set to be replaced with a $12 million 10-bed centre that will be owned by the Accident Compensation Corporation under a public-private partnership. A Bulla resident, Paul Scanlon, says the funding model has, been driven, has driven the design of a shoebox-sized facility. The main concerns of the community is being in, in, in private ownership, it, it, it's actually proven worldwide that we will have reduced services and much higher costs. Geographically, we're going to have to travel longer distances just for health services. That, that, that will be the bottom line. Paul Scanlon says the community will continue protesting until they get a hospital owned by the District Health Board. Donga's King has dissolved the country's parliament and called for fresh elections. The decision marks the downfall of Akalisi Pohiva, the first commoner to be elected prime minister in 2014. His government has been marred by controversy and allegations of incompetence, and he survived a motion of no confidence last year. The decision came about after the Speaker of Parliament approached King Tupo and a decision was made by the Privy Council. An official announcement is due to be made within hours. A secondary school association says a special allowance for only Auckland teachers will create shortages in regions and smaller centres. The government is to extend its voluntary bonding scheme to all primary schools in Auckland. Under the scheme aimed at retaining teachers in low decile schools, teachers get $10,000 at the end of their third year and further funds after that. The head of the Auckland Secondary Deputy and Assistant Principals Association, James Clark, says the incentive is good for Auckland, but but it could reduce teachers in other areas that are also struggling. Mr Clark says more investment is needed to attract more people to the profession. The mother of a teenager sentenced for his part in a violent dairy robbery pleaded with the court to have forgiveness for her son and his friends. Daniel Seuli, who's 17, and brothers 18-year-old Sam and 20-year-old Longo Tiafilo, had more than a dozen supporters in the Monaco District Court today as they were sentenced. The three of them, with a 15-year-old, raided the Kingsford supermarket in Mangari in May with a machete and crowbar, injuring a shop assistant. Seuli's mother fought back tears as she spoke to the court, describing her son's actions as a terrible mistake. He made a big mistake of his life. He's really guilty and he's really sorry for what he did. And when I heard the news, it breaks my heart because this is not my son. Daniel Seuli was given two years and six months in jail and Sam and Longo Tiafilo both received two years and nine months. Airports are worried if a Court of Appeal ruling is left to stand, it could render several runways non-compliant. Earlier this year, the Court of Appeal said runway safety areas must extend to 240 metres if practicable. The Civil Aviation Authority and Wellington Airport say that could force several airports to lengthen the safety areas at the expense of usable runway or extreme cost. The Court has reserved its decision. Inland Revenue is warning people about a scam being sent to people via email in order to obtain their credit card details. It received about 120 calls today about the scam, which appears to be coming from an Inland Revenue Department email with a, fax a fake tax return form attached. The email says the recipient has a tax refund waiting and asks them to update their financial information to get their refund. An IRD spokesman, Rowan MacArthur, says people should not open their email or fill it out. We get a lot of these things but we're 
concerned about this one in particular because it looks more sophisticated. The email and the form look more convincing than we've been used to, so we're more concerned that more people will be taken in. Rowan MacArthur says IID is investigating the scam. It's five past five. Sport and Wallabies skipper Michael Hooper has backed Isaac Rodder to make the most of an unexpected test debut against New Zealand. Adam Coleman's late withdrawal with a shoulder injury means Rodder will come off the bench in tomorrow's second Bledisloe Cup clash in Dunedin with Rory Arnold to start in the second row. Hooper says losing Coleman is a blow. We know he was pushing to the last minute to get it right but just couldn't get there. But in saying that, um, as always, opens the door for Rods there and uh, you know, with Lepetti on the bench, it's um, really strong. Michael Hooper. Meanwhile, All Black captain Kieran Reid says they have to expect the Wallabies will try to get under their skin. If we can go out there and try and play our game and play it fair, play it clean uh, and play it really hard, then a lot of that extra stuff doesn't come into the game. So we've just got to make sure we can do that. Uh, we'll adapt to whatever they bring to us. Kieran Reid. The Silver Ferns have a point to prove in their international netball series following comments from an Australian official that they won't even make the final of next year's Commonwealth Games. The Ferns captain Katrina Grant says the comments come as no surprise. In all these um, pinnacle events we always seem to go in as underdogs but that suits us fine. We've made all the finals for Com Games and things like that and winning in 2010 and it's entertaining for us and we just think you know that just gives us more fire and just really wanting to knuckle down and do what we need to do. Katrina Grant, the Silver Ferns play South Africa in their opening quad series game in Brisbane tomorrow night before meeting England and Australia next week. That's the news. It's the biggest construction boom in New Zealand's history and the industry's struggling. What we're, we're dealing with is a system that's set up to fail and not to fail well. The squeeze is on to cut corners around quality and safety. There's immense pressure on engineers to do what the builders want them to do. I'm Phil Pennington and Insight investigates if the building boom might just blow up in our faces. Just after the 8 o'clock news on Sunday morning with Wallace Chapman on RNZ National. Met surface weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Coromandel Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. Cloudy periods and a few showers. Auckland to Taranaki, including Taumiranui and Taupo, mainly fine. A few showers tomorrow, but clearing Auckland in the afternoon. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa, also Whanganui and Taihepe to Wellington. Fine, apart from some cloud about Wellington and Kapiti at times. Nelson and Buller, cloudy periods and the odd shower. Westland, scattered showers, turning to rain tomorrow morning, then clearing north of Hokitika in the evening. Marlborough, Canterbury, North Otago and Dunedin, fine with high cloud. Central Otago, Clutha and Southland, often cloudy with light rain at times. Fiordland, rain, heavy at times and for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. It's eight past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Kia ora Katrina. Labour is promising Dunedin Labour is promising Dunedin will get a new $1.4 billion central city hospital in its first term of government, entirely funded by the taxpayer in a bid to woo southern voters plagued by surgery delays. The party today took its scalpel out to National's promise to rebuild Dunedin Hospital within seven to ten years, possibly through a public-private partnership. While Labour was focused on health care, National was also in the South, committing to charging international tourists double what they pay now to use the country's great walks. Here's Jacob McSweeney with a roundup of today's political action. I got a little snippet of it on Instagram. <laughs> there we go. Here we are. I'm Jacinda Ardern. I'm Jacinda Ardern. I'm Jacinda Ardern. As Labour leader Jacinda Ardern tried to make an announcement about a new hospital for Dunedin, she was followed by a crowd of about 400 students and locals chanting her name. She then turned around and told reporters how Labour would go about building a new $1.4 billion hospital in the city. First of all, we're committing to making sure that the hospital is built in the city. Um, we do not believe it should be a PPP. That means that we'll be able to deliver the hospital much, much earlier than the government is promising. Jacinda Ardern says the project is long overdue and if elected to government, a working group focused on the new hospital would immediately be formed with local councils, DHBs, Otago University and the Health Ministry. At the other end of the country, Labour's transport spokesperson Michael Wood announced the party would put $30 million towards the Sky Path, a walking and cycling pathway over the Auckland Harbour Bridge. What we need on a major project like this that will transform life for the better is some leadership. And the Labour Party will provide 
that leadership. And so what I am absolutely delighted to announce today is that the Labour Party will fund Skypath. The Skypath project has resource consent, but the government has yet to pledge any funding for it. Michael Wood says the party will also renew the $100 million Urban Cycleways Fund for another three years and establish a new fund to encourage cycling and walking at a neighbourhood level. Walking was also on national leader Bill English's agenda in Queenstown, where he announced a plan to double the price that international tourists pay on New Zealand's five most popular great walks. They are the Milford, Rootburn, Kepler, Abel Tasman and Tongarero. We've worked out that the great walks, popular as they are globally, actually make a $1 million loss. We believe it's fair that those who are willing to travel around the world to have those experiences help us with the real cost of maintaining those walks. So the $4 million that is raised from that will be directly recycled back into the maintenance of those assets. The doubling of the charge from $70 to $140 to use huts for those great walks would come into effect from October next year. Fees for the remaining great walks and backcountry hut passes would cost 50% more. The government will also double the Department of Conservation's community funds from $4.6 million to $10 million a year. For Checkpoint, Jacob McSweeney. A mother has told a court her son made the biggest mistake of his life when he took part in a violent robbery of a South Auckland supermarket. Three men aged between 17 and 20 were sentenced in Manukau District Court this morning after they raided the Kingsford supermarket in Mangari in May using a crowbar and machete. One of the men's mother gave an emotional address to the court, saying her son was a good boy who had made a stupid mistake. Joanna McKenzie was there. 17-year-old Daniel Sayuli and brothers 18-year-old Sam and 20-year-old Longo Teofilo had more than a dozen supporters in court as they were sentenced. Their crime took place on the 16th of May when they raided the supermarket with a 15-year-old accomplice, pushing a shop assistant to the ground, beating him and holding him in a headlock with the machete pressed to his neck. Sayuli's mother fought back tears as she spoke to the court, describing her son's terrible mistake. He made a big mistake of his life. He's really guilty and he's really sorry for what he did. And when I heard the news, it breaks my heart because this is not my son. She went on to ask the court's forgiveness for the three. I'm asking you please to forgive my son and also that's your brothers for what they did. <coughs> Judge Soana Mawala described having to sentence the men to prison as another terrible day at Manako District Court, but it was something that she saw all too often. She acknowledged the family members in court and that the men came from loving homes. You are three young men who are otherwise of good character. Some of you have anger problems, some of you have some addictions, but by and large, you have had good upbringings. Your family have tried to raise you uh, in the right way and teach you right from wrong. You have attended church and you are loved uh, and supported by your family. At the time of the attack, the victim, Vikas Singh, told Checkpoint that the men put a knife to his throat and asked for money. He said he felt unsafe in New Zealand and his family in India were desperately worried for him. Both the Seuli and Teofilo families had scraped together emotional harm reparations for Mr Singh to try to make amends. That, along with their early pleas, letters of remorse and cooperation with police, was awarded a reduction in sentence from the starting point of six years. But Judge Moala said their crime was simply too serious to avoid jail. The offending is so serious. Your use of weapons... The number of you, four of you, going into that store uh, and scaring uh, the complainant uh, and committing acts of violence against him. Judge Moala said the outcome from the attack could have been so much worse. And you had a machete, you had a, gr a crowbar and you used violence against him. And I'm afraid that I am unable uh, to get down to a sentence of two years uh, imprisonment for any of you. She said all the work that the men had done to try to make amends did persuade her to give them sentences lower than three years. 
Daniel Sayuli was given two years and six months. Sam Teofilo was sentenced to two years and nine months, as was his brother Longo, who was also ordered to pay emotional harm reparation to the victim of $1,000. The 15-year-old, who also took part in the raid, has been dealt with by the youth court. For Checkpoint, Itamaki Makoto, called Joanna McKenzie Aho. The co-leader of the Māori Party, Marama Fox, says Mike Hosking has got it wrong again. The Seven Sharp presenter went to air last night to clarify a blunder over his earlier comments that people needed to be on the Māori roll to vote for the Māori Party. But Ms Fox says Mr Hosking now has now blamed the Māori Party for being confused and he's got no idea that she got into Parliament on the party list. Our Māori Issues correspondent Mihinga Rangi Forbes reports. The Māori Party's List MP Marama Fox lost her voice this week from political debates and singing at the King's coronation. But she found a way to be heard today and called TVNZ broadcaster Mike Hosking to account after the party claims he abused his position of power and influence to mislead the nation. Last night he clarified his earlier comment when he said voters on the general roll couldn't vote for the Māori Party. Here's what he said. Small clarification for you. Now, last night, in a throwaway line, I appear to have confused the Maori party around the rules of voting in MMP. Now, what I was suggesting, what I was meaning, was that the Maori party, as their representation stands, is an electorate party. In other words, they are only in parliament because they've won an electorate seat. That clarification has left the Maori party astonished, and Ms Fox responded with this. And so he clearly has no idea what he's talking about because I came off the list. I am Marama Fox. I am a list MP for the Māori Party. He can see that on any website or the Parliament's official page if he bothered to do any checking at all. A TVNZ staffer told RNZ that in the morning the Seven Sharp Bulletin had an apology loaded in, but by the afternoon it had changed to a clarification. RNZ asked TVNZ whether the clarification was meant to be an apology, and its head of news and current affairs, John Gillespie, issued this statement. In response to your questions, we acknowledge the comments made on Wednesday night on Seven Sharp needed clarifying to clear up any confusion. That's why, in the same show, in the same time slot last night, it was clarified. But Madame Fox isn't buying that. Oh, well, this was a sorry, not sorry moment from Mike Hosking. The clarification, that was no clarification at all. And he got it wrong again. He's completely misled the public. He is completely incompetent. And someone who's been a, a commentator on political issues for a long time, you'd think he'd know better. The party's president, Tukuroirangi Morgan, has called on Māori corporations to boycott the show's key sponsor, ASB. I want them to reconsider their business. The ASB is the primary sponsor of the Seven Sharp show, and to have someone like Mike Hoskins as a political commentator and uh, facilitator for the political debates is unacceptable. And ASB's GM Corporate Communications' Christian May responded like this. ASB has no direct commercial relationship with Mike Hosking in his role as one of Seven Sharp's presenters. Rather, our arrangement is with Seven Sharp as New Zealand's most watched current affairs show. Marama Fox has attempted to contact ASB's management today, but has yet to hear back. But one RNZ listener, Nicola Gaston, who has never voted for the Māori Party, says she's reconsidering her business with ASB after a 30-year relationship. It's about ethics and broadcasting, and around election time, I think that's particularly important. If this is not properly corrected on, on Seven Sharp, and if ASB continue to not care, um, then, yeah, I will, I will probably go down that path. Meanwhile, the Māori Party is considering other action against Seven Sharp, including complaining to the Broadcasting Standards Authority. Mō te hōtaka o te ahiahinei ko Mihingarangi Forbes. Aho. A senior GP says poor and vulnerable people will pay the price of a loss of $29 million in funding by Northland District Health Board. Checkpoint revealed yesterday a gap, a cap in the funding formula used for all DHBs means Northland will go without the extra funding. It comes as new figures out today show that 12 of the country's 20 DHBs are struggling to balance their books. Our health correspondent Karen Brown reports. 
A $60 million blowout was laid bare today as the Ministry of Health released the financial performance of the 20 DHBs for the latest financial year. The DHBs chalked up a combined $117.5 million deficit, more than double the previous year's deficit of $54 million and $53 million more than the Health Minister Jonathan Coleman predicted two weeks ago. The worst performers were Canterbury, which posted a $51 million deficit, Capital and Coast, which is $25 million in the red, Counties Manukau, almost $13 million, and the beleaguered Southern DHB, which is $21 million in the red. The Northland, Hutt Valley, Lakes, Tairawhiti, Taranaki, Wairarapa, West Coast and Whanganui DHBs were also in poor health. Labour's health spokesperson David Clark says it's a dire situation. Those DHBs are under extreme pressure and in particular Canterbury in the aftermath of the earthquakes with the growing mental health need and the pressure that their facilities are under for elective surgery. They've signalled these things well in advance and the government has refused to engage with them on how to best address these matters. Ian Powell of the Senior Doctors' Union blames government under funding. We've had since 2010 on conservative estimates about $1.4 billion in relative terms being sucked out of the District Health Board funding. And yet the demand on District Health Boards, particularly our public hospitals, to do more and more has increased. The Health Minister, Jonathan Coleman, was unavailable to be interviewed about the budget blowout today, but last night told Checkpoint while the deficit was higher than expected, services would not suffer. Still less than 160 million of deficits that we inherited, and the bottom line is none of these DHBs will run out of cash. So there is plenty of cash there. Clinical services will not suffer. There is no way services will be cut. They will only continue to increase, and that's the key point. Look, these are balance sheet discussions, but actually services are improving and increasing in every DHB, including Northland. The Northland DHB, which posted a $2.2 million deficit, yesterday revealed concerns about the current financial year. In a letter to staff, the Northland Chief Executive Nick Chamberlain said the DHB would not be submitting its 2017-18 budget or annual plan to the Ministry because the board would not sign off on a projected $7.5 million deficit. Dr Chamberlain said factors including Northland's rising population and high needs mean it should receive 6.6% more funding. But he said a cap within the funding formula meant it would only get 4 to 5% more each year, leaving a major gap. Wellsford-based Tim Malloy, president of the College of GPs, says it's absurd given the high health needs in the district. There'll be increasing pressure on the services that are being provided in the hospitals, which will then trickle down to increasing pressure on primary care, which will ultimately mean that the community itself is essentially poorly served, and that will mean poor health outcomes for some of the most vulnerable patients in the whole of the country. The DHB wouldn't comment today, but Dr Malloy says he believes the funding restriction only affects Northland, where growth has been highest. The net result is a mismatch between the services required by the population of Northland and the amount of funding that's been applied. And this, I believe, is relatively unique to this particular district health board, which makes it again absurd. He says Northland's well served by its public hospitals and GPs are grateful. But nationwide, GPs worry about cash-strapped DHBs not spending more in the community. The ability to invest in other things, for example, to invest in primary care, has proven very difficult for not just this district health board, but all district health boards. The Ministry of Health says in relation to the Northland DHB, the population-based funding formula was recently reviewed to ensure it remained a fair and equitable way of distributing funding to the DHBs, and as a result, a number of minor changes were made. It says Northland's funding growth has increased by an average of 4.82% over the last three years, the largest increase out of all DHBs. Mo te hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Karen Brown tēnei. Last night, the Health Minister Jonathan Coleman told Checkpoint he wouldn't speak with the Northern DHB Chief Executive Nick Chamberlain about his letter, but he would consider speaking with the board's chairperson. The Northland DHB board chair is Sally McCauley. Now, a short time ago, our producer Bridget Burke asked her if she expected to hear from him. I, I don't expect I will be. 
no. Um, I will make no comment as to uh, what the minister said. That is uh, the minister's um, decision, but I know I do not expect to be speaking to him. Would you like to speak to him? I don't think it is necessary for me to speak to him. So what correspondence will the board expect to receive from the ministry now that it refuses to sign off on its annual plan for 17-18? Um, I can't tell you. I won't make any comment uh, from that, uh, about that. But realistically, what will happen if an annual plan, which means a budget, is not signed off? Um, well, realistically, I'm not, I, I'm not really at liberty to discuss that. I, I'm not here to talk about uh, the budget with you, Bridget. I'm really just wanting to talk about the um, quality and care we have for our staff. So apart from that, I'm not at liberty to make any other comment. Sally, have, ha, Sally, have you been able to speak to your chief executive since posting this letter yesterday? Yes, I have spoken to him. And yes. what was that conversation like? Oh, fine. And you Absolutely have full fine. Um, the chief executive and I um, get on extremely well. Um, he's an extremely um, uh, high-profile man who works very, very hard, and he, he gets a lot of successes. We're very lucky to have um, an intelligent, hard-working chief executive. You also received a copy of the letter that was sent out to staff yesterday, Sally. I did, yes. And you endorse all of its content? I'm not going to make any comment. But do you that. share I'm his view? I'm not making any more comments. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, thank you for speaking. Thank you. And that is the Northland DHB chairperson, Sally McCauley. And Ms McCauley says the Northland DHB is concerned about the well-being of its staff, and that's why the letter was written. Some Buller residents on the South Island's west coast are fighting the development of a new health centre, which they say is not fit for purpose. The district's current 35-bed hospital is set to be replaced with a $12 million 10-bed centre that will be owned by the Accident Compensation Corporation under a public-private partnership funding model. But residents say that model has driven the design of a shoebox-sized facility that won't leave them better off. Maya Burry reports. 90-year-old Phil Phipps has lived in the West Coast's Buller District her whole life. She is deeply concerned about what the new health centre, about a quarter of the size of the current hospital, could mean for the area she loves so dearly. Well, I've never been involved with uh, hospitals very much because I'm luckily been a fairly fit person and been in lots of sporting things and all sorts of things in Buller all my life. The Buller system has always been pretty good here for what we've wanted, but now they want what they want to put in its place is absolutely disastrous. Ms Phipps says Buller Hospital services more than 10,000 people in the district, stretching from Karamea to Punakaiki. She says the new centre won't have anywhere near the capacity to cope with the current population, let alone an ageing one. Well, I'm, at my age, of course, I've got to think about it, of course, there's no doubt about that, yeah. And it has to be here, and uh, yeah, we have to have the services here. In May, the government announced a plan for the West Coast District Health Board to enter into a long-term lease deal with ACC for the new $12 million facility with construction expected to be completed in 2019. Westport resident Paul Scanlon says that funding model has driven the design of a shoebox-sized facility that is not fit for purpose. The main concerns of the community is, being in, in, in private ownership, it, it, it's actually proven worldwide that we will have reduced services and much higher costs because at the end of the day when the DHB are going to be like running the hospital and they have a choice about um, supplying some sort of health service or, or, or paying the rent, then they pay the rent. Mr Scanlon says concerned residents have already held several protests over the new facility, with another planned in Westport this weekend. He says if the new centre goes ahead, it will force people to travel to other districts for health care. Geographically, we're going to have to travel longer distances just for health services. You know, it's... Uh, we believe this is just going to be treated as a triage centre. So there, there's a myriad of, of issues as it, that comes as a result of this. You know, trying, trying to retain and, and 
gain good staff when we have inadequate facilities, it will, will be a, a huge issue. And, and we'll just have to drive a, a long distances for our health. But it's not just residents who are concerned. The Association of Salaried Medical Specialists Executive Director Ian Powell says the district is being used as a guinea pig by the government to test a public-private partnership funding model that is also being considered to pay for Dunedin's new hospital and a surgical block in Christchurch. Mr Powell says the model has been poorly researched and won't leave Buller better off. The quality of the, and the range of health services provided in this new facility, if this bizarre proposal is implemented, will be the quality will be at risk and the accessibility will be at risk. They will get less than what they would otherwise get through direct government funding. In a statement, the Ministry of Health said many DHBs in New Zealand lease premises at commercial rates. It says the architects will work with user groups to refine the design of the facility. For Checkpoint, Maya Burry. From a small US town has quit the hospital job she's held for 32 years after winning more than one billion New Zealand dollars in a Powerball draw. Mavis Wanzik, whose husband was killed in a hit and run accident last year, fronted a press conference to claim her prize. I was leaving work at night and I leave with, a, um, with, with this guy Rob, he's a chicken fireman and we just happened to walk out and he said, I bet you somebody won with these numbers as birthdays. And I went, oh yeah, I know, it's never gonna be me. It's just a pipe dream I've always had. And he's reading these numbers and I pull mine out and I go, hey, I have that, I, I have that, I, I have that. And he goes, let me see that ticket. He goes, you just won. I go, you're joking, come on, please. He says, sign that ticket now. Mrs. Wanzik says she picked her numbers at random but added the number four because that's a family favourite for Friday night kino. I want to be just, just me and just be alone and just be able to be me and figure out what I want to do. I had a pipe dream and my pipe dream has finally come true. I wanted to retire in 12 and it came early. Beyond early retirement, the mother of two adult children said she hadn't decided how to spend her winnings or whether she would take a lump sum or annual payments over 29 years. The Multi-State Lottery Association said the odds of having all six numbers were 292.2 million to one. Meanwhile, the Massachusetts store that sold the winning ticket plans to donate its $50,000 prize for selling the winning ticket to charity. Coming up, hundreds of school teachers may have missed out on thousands of dollars from a special allowance because they hardly anyone knew they were eligible. The Porirua City Council says it's at a loss to explain what's causing parts of a Whitby street to subside. And Nelson schools its first ever All Blacks test. Don't forget you can text us on 21, you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ and Facebook, Facebook us Checkpoint with John Campbell. Uh, that's all coming up after the news headlines with Katrina Batten. The Labour Party is confident it can build the new Dunedin Hospital faster than the National Party if elected to government. The party says the $1.4 billion project could be paid for out of existing taxpayer funds rather than the National Party's proposal for a public-private partnership or PPP. Labour's leader Jacinda Ardern says the bill would start in the first term of a Labour-led government and she's confident it will be completed faster than National's seven to ten year plan. A Westport resident says the Buller community will continue protesting until they get a hospital owned by the District Health Board. The district's 35-bed hospital is set to be replaced with a $12 million 10-bed centre that will be owned by the Accident Compensation Corporation under a public-private partnership. Paul Scanlon says the funding model has driven the design of a shoebox-sized facility. A secondary school association says a special allowance for only Auckland teachers will create shortages in regions and smaller centres. The government is to extend its voluntary bonding scheme to all primary schools in Auckland. 
Under the scheme aimed at retaining teachers in low decile schools, teachers get $10,000 at the end of their third year and further funds after that. The mother of a teenager sentenced for his part in a violent dairy robbery pleaded with the court to have forgiveness for her son and his friends. Daniel Seuli, who's 17, and brothers 18-year-old Sam and 20-year-old Longo Teofilo raided the Kingsford supermarket in Mangari in May with a machete and crowbar, injuring a shop assistant. Seuli's mother fought back tears as she spoke to the court, describing her son's actions as a terrible mistake. Thonga's king has dissolved the country's parliament and called for fresh elections. The decision marks the downfall of Akalisi Pohiva, the first commoner to be elected prime minister in 2014. His government has been marred by controversy and allegations of incompetence. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six o'clock. Thank you, Katrina. Turning to business news now with Giles Beckford. And Giles, we've almost seen the last of the company earnings report. Just a small number out today. Good evening to you, Sharon. Yes, actually, I note that you did the billion-dollar lottery win before the news headlines and before business rather than listening to our company results. But never mind, we won't take it personally. One company that stood out today was Port of Tauranga, which is, of course, the country's biggest port. Uh, it is our trade gateway. It spent uh, the best part of a third of a billion dollars, $350 million in the past four years, to dredge a deeper channel into the port. It's upgraded its cranes and its wharves, uh, straddle containers and roads and the infrastructure which supports that. It now takes the biggest container ships in the world. These are vessels that, ha that handle up to 10,000 containers uh, in one voyage. They have them on board. It's the only port in New Zealand and one of the few in the region that's uh, able to take big ships like that. It gives it a competitive advantage and it's getting the payback. The profit was up uh, quite considerable, about 5 6% today. But um, it certainly set it on a platform for good earnings growth in the future. And what it also points out is the, the fact that uh, New Zealand probably has a lot of little ports who are going to fade a little bit more into insignificance. They're going to become feeder ports to the likes of the port of Tauranga. So they'll be sending cargo to and pick, having cargo sent from Tauranga. This is the likes of the Napiers, Wellington, Picton, uh, Bluff, uh, Whangarei and the like. So they uh, essentially have been demoted by the fact that the Port of Tauranga has stolen a march on everybody, including, of course, its big rival, which is the Port of Auckland. So more from them in the future. But uh, in the meantime, that was the one that stood out for today. Giles, what's the view of analysts on the quality of numbers reported? Well, generally, uh, it's been a, a thumbs up, uh, as one broker put it in a sort of a, a, a progress report, saying that uh, it was a glass half full reporting season. There haven't been too many misses. Quite a few companies have managed to just exceed expectations. Uh, their revenues have been good, their earnings good, their dividends have been good, and there have been a few little presents for shareholders with special dividends. Uh, the point being uh, that, of course, when uh, companies are performing this well, um, it's that little bit more difficult to keep go growing, especially in an economy that may be perhaps at its peak and, and on its turn. So uh, for the time being, companies have done pretty well. They've made some hay while the sun has been shining. Uh, whether they'll be able to sustain, sustain this in the next couple of years uh, will be the real test. But for now, thumbs up. We've still got a couple to go on Monday. The main ones are that MetLife Care, the retirement village operator, and Chorus which is the telephone and uh, broadband infrastructure provider. Uh, they really are the two last significant ones before we've got to wait about another month for the retailers uh, of the likes of Warehouse and Fonterra. And the markets, what happened today? Uh, that top 50 index, another sedate day, just down 11 points at 7858. The New Zealand dollar going quietly into the weekend at 72.1 United States cents and 91.2 Australian. And one thing to look out for over the weekend, the meeting of central bankers and their chums at the rather quaintly named Jackson Hole Ski Resort in the United States. Uh, if ever there was a, a place to avoid, I think it'll be that one for this weekend. Thanks very much, Giles. That's our business editor, Giles Beckford. Now, hundreds of school teachers may have missed out on thousands of dollars from a special allowance because hardly anyone knew about it. The voluntary bonding scheme was introduced in 2009 to attract and retain new teachers in low decile schools. The government is now going to extend the scheme to all Auckland schools. Eva Coulette reports. 
The national scheme was introduced to help low decile schools that had trouble recruiting teachers. Now that will be extended to all schools in Auckland. Eligible teachers get the $10,000 at the end of their third year teaching and a further $3,500 at the end of their fourth or fifth years. In 2013, 283 people were awarded the grant, but figures from the Ministry of Education show the numbers have been slowly dropping, down to 131 last year and 59 this year so far. The Primary School Teachers Union, the New Zealand Educational Institute, says 74 schools are currently eligible for the scheme in the Auckland region. But its president, Linda Stewart, says almost no principal or teacher knew the scheme existed and many have missed out as a result. She says in the past two days more than 300 out of 2,000 teachers who have contacted the union are eligible under the original scheme. When you know that there's a staffing crisis and you're looking at ways that you can alleviate that, that surely if you do have a scheme like that in place, you would be looking to publicise it. Ms Stewart says widening the scheme is a good move because all schools are struggling with shortages. But she says it's a knee-jerk reaction to the teacher shortage. This is good for Auckland, that's great, and we know that Auckland's got its really difficult situations around housing and around transport and infrastructure, but there are other areas of this country that are also suffering teacher shortage, and we want to know what's going to be happening for them. The Auckland Secondary Deputy and Assistant Principals Association says a special allowance for only Auckland teachers will create shortages in regions and smaller centres. Its president, James Clark, says the incentive is good for Auckland, but it could pull teachers away from other areas that are also struggling to find and keep teachers. In some ways, the teaching profession is a bit of a merry-go-round. Instead of increasing the number of people getting on to the merry-go-round, it's just the same number of people moving around the same number of schools. Now, that's a sweeping generalisation, but um, you know that is somewhat of our experience. Mr Clark says more investment is needed to attract people to the profession. It's an incentive really to be in a place. It's not particularly an incentive to start teaching or to become part of the teaching profession. It's also not really an incentive to stay much beyond five or six years in schools, which is where we're losing uh, large numbers of our teachers. Mr Clark says he also knew nothing about the scheme until now. A spokesperson at the Ministry of Education, Pauline Cleaver, says she was concerned to hear some schools were unaware of the scheme and the Ministry has notified all eligible schools this week. The New Zealand Educational Institute is calling for the government to back pay those who missed out on the money. The ministry says it's not usual to retrospectively pay people, but it will look into it. I tamaki makaurau mō te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Eva Corlett tēnei. US President Donald Trump is back in Washington after his flying visit to Arizona and other western states and is picking a new fight with fellow Republicans. However, the White House is attempting to downplay reports of tensions between Mr Trump and senior Republican Party figures, including the House leader Mitch McConnell. In recent weeks, the president has repeatedly criticised Mr McConnell for the Republicans' failure last month to pass a health care reform bill and openly mused about his possibility of him relinquishing his post. CNN's Jim Acosta has more on the rift. President Trump is once again trolling one of his favorite Twitter targets, his own party, tweeting, The only problem I have with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is that after hearing repeal and replace for seven years, he failed. That should never have happened. No big deal, says the White House. I think the relationships are fine. Uh, Certainly there are going to be some policy differences, um, but there are also a lot of shared goals. Despite that talk of shared goals, the president is threatening to shut down the government if Congress refuses to fund a wall on the border with Mexico, a threat the White House isn't knocking down. We know that the wall and other security measures at the border work. We've seen that take place over the last decade, and we're committed to making sure the American people are protected. And we're going to continue to push forward and make sure that the wall gets built. Still outraged over his defeat on health care, the president is also playing the blame game on the need to raise the nation's debt ceiling, a battle set for next month that could rattle financial markets. Mr. Trump claims he tried to attach a debt ceiling measure to a bill to help veterans, tweeting that McConnell and House Speaker Paul Ryan didn't do it. So now we have a big deal with Dems holding them up, as usual, on debt ceiling approval. Could have been so easy. Now a mess. Ryan's response? 
don't worry. The path for the debt ceiling is we will, we will pass legislation to make sure that we pay our debts and we will not hit the debt ceiling. Does it get tiring us asking you about the president every time we see you? McConnell is also trying to lower the temperature, refusing to take questions about his relationship with the president while explaining what he's up against in the Senate. You know, I'm often asked what is being the majority leader of the Senate like. The best answer I've been able to think of is it's a little bit like being a groundskeeper at a cemetery. Everybody's under you, but nobody's listening. That's what you get with 52 to 48. <laughs> but top GOP aides on Capitol Hill have had it, with one source telling CNN the president is attacking leaders while we're selling his agenda. And for our friends in the Senate, oh boy. A frequent target of the president's ire, Senator Lindsey Graham said he sees a strategy in the president's outbursts. He's running against Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and others. The Congress is very unpopular, particularly with the Republican base. So there's nothing unhinged about it. It's a political strategy that I'm not so sure is smart, but it's a very thought out strategy. There's nothing uh, crazy about it. It's a, it's a political strategy. The White House did address the growing chorus of criticism of the president's handling of Charlottesville. Asked about GOP Senator Bob Corker's stinging assessment of the president. The president has not yet, um, has not yet been able to demonstrate the stability uh, nor some of the competence that he needs to demonstrate in order to be successful. Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders lashed out. Uh, I think that's a ridiculous and outrageous claim and doesn't dignify a response from this podium. Now for the moment, the president's attacks on his party have yet to backfire inside the GOP. Poll after poll here in the U.S. shows that while some support is slipping among conservatives, they are sticking with the president, proving once again the GOP is not the party of Paul Ryan, it's not the party of Mitch McConnell, it's the party of Trump. It's CNN's Jim Acosta with that report. The Porirua City Council says it's at a loss to explain what's causing parts of a Whitby street to subside. The northern end of Albatross Close has been subsiding for the past four years and has dropped 90 millimetres in the past week. Residents say navigating it is like driving over waves. And as Eric Frickberg reports, they say the council has been slow to act. Subsidence has brought bumps and troughs to Porirua's Albatross Close. The council's installed temporary barriers to slow traffic so drivers can negotiate the worst of the subsidence safely. There are more than 50 houses on the street. 14-year-old Sarah King lives opposite the worst affected part. As the cars were driving past, you can see the ground is like a sponge. And as they drive over it, the ground sinks in and bounces up as they go past. It's just really annoying, like, they're not really trying to do anything about it, and we just want that problem fixed. The subsidence is worst on the downhill side of the road, but it's causing cracks in the gardens of properties on the uphill side of the street, as the ground under the roadway pulls incrementally away from the hillside above. Sarah's brother Samuel King is frustrated. Kind of scary, it's just nothing like, seems to be happening about it. And you just see it like sinking more and more. We've been complaining about nothing's been done. All you're doing is just covering it over, not actually solving the problem, just prettying it up. Porirua Council has been aware of the problem for a while and came last September to try to remedy it. Another neighbour, 70 year old Glenn Richardson, describes what they did. I went down a metre in their digging until they've hit the high clay. Then they completely filled it all up with large stones and then they put the surface on top. But even then they did say it's a temporary measurement until they could actually find out more as to what is the actual problem. A senior Porirua council official, Tamsin Evans, says geotechnical examinations last September found underground water was the problem and six drains were installed to carry that water away. For almost a year, it worked. But over the past week, the street subsided 90 millimetres and it requires further investigation. Ms Evans admits the council's unsure about what to do next. Well, until you know what it is, you can't know what the solution might be. So we've got some further geotechnical investigations to do. And we've got some further survey work to do. We'll be doing some boreholes to try and find out the depth of the problem, the nature of the problem and the scope of it. And then we can start to look at what the solutions might be. 
Tamsin Evans rejects the suggestion that the council has been too slow to respond. To some extent we can never work fast enough for people when there's a problem around their property, particularly one where it's an inexplicable cause. I'm satisfied that we've responded as well as we can since we had a call on Friday to say the road had started to move again. Ms Evans says the geotechnical survey work is due to be done next week and the boreholes will be drilled down a week or so after that. In the meantime, all the council can do is to monitor the traffic until they find out more. For Checkpoint, call Eric frickberg Tenne. New Zealand rugby is on the verge of being global champions of both the men's and women's game. The Black Ferns can join the All Blacks as world champions on Sunday morning if they can topple defending champions England in the Women's Rugby World Cup final in Belfast. While the All Blacks are again expected to trample over the Wallabies in the second Bledisloe Cup test in Dunedin tomorrow night, the Black Ferns will have a tougher assignment, overcoming England, as Bridget Honeycliffe reports. Shows the pass, it's gone forward, an advantage here for New Zealand. And now out to Brazier. Woodman is outside Brazier, but Brazier's got lovely footwork. Kelly Brazier does the impossible! The Black Ferns are chasing their fifth World Cup title, but the prospect of running away with the final against England, like they did against the United States in the semis, is unlikely. England are the defending champions, and they reminded the Black Ferns of that when the two sides contested the Four Nations decider a couple of months ago in Rotorua, when they beat New Zealand 29-21. That said, the Black Ferns had won their five previous encounters and are ranked number one in the world. Carla Hohepa played in the Black Ferns side, which won the 2010 title, but then took a break from the game before returning to the sport last year. We've been very fortunate to get a bit more time together to prepare. Um, our management and leadership group are world class, so I think when you have all the little things right, it just um, the team just clicks. But yeah, I think just a great team unity and the team is playing for each other, which um, hopefully we do in the final and come away with the win. Discipline, though, has been a problem for the Black Ferns. In three of their four matches at the tournament, they've had at least one player sinbinned. Winger Portia Woodman, who is the tournament's leading try scorer, says they can't afford to let that happen in the final. Oh, we've still got a lot of improvement. We, you know, we can't get another yellow card in this game because England is such a physical side in that they play the game at, at pace. So if we have one man down, it puts us under stress outside and then even through the middle. So we, we've got to stay disciplined. While the World Cup final in Belfast is expected to be a tight affair, the same can't be said for the second Bledisloe Cup test between the All Blacks and the Wallabies in Dunedin tomorrow night. The Wallabies hope to atone for their 20-point thrashing last weekend in Sydney. They trailed 54-6 at one stage and former Wallaby players wasted little time inventing their displeasure with former first five Michael Liner labelling the side schoolboys. But assistant Wallabies coach McBurn, who spent 10 years on the All Blacks coaching staff, says critics only need to look at the All Blacks of 2007 to realise the tide can turn. The All Blacks were bundled out of the 2007 World Cup in the quarterfinals, but have dominated the sport since, winning successive Webb Ellis trophies in 2011 and 2015. You see it as an opportunity to get better and you know I honestly believe that when you're inside we know where we're going with it uh, when we're, we're not executing at some of the things we'd like to but you know what we're trying to get better every day. Having led 54-6 and then allowing the Wallabies to score four unanswered second half tries the All Blacks too are looking for plenty of improvement and coach Steve Hansen is weary of the Wallabies now that they have a game under their belt. To be able to play with an intensity and a pace that test level brings, you got to be able to play. So I think they'll be a lot sharper of mind and body. They'll be desperate because uh, things in Australia, there's a lot of negativity and one of their responsibilities is to try and put some smiles on some faces. Uh, they'll be hurting, so that'll make them even hungrier than they have been. And they know if, if they don't get it right this week, you know, there's the blues logo on. Tomorrow night's test will be Ben Smith's last match of the year as he's taking time off from the sport. New Zealand rugby will also honour the late Sir Colin Meads at the match. All Blacks lock Sam Whitelock, who shares the number five jersey with Sir Colin, will give his playing jersey to the Meads family, while a moment's silence will also be observed before the match. For Checkpoint, Bridget Honeycliffe. 
And staying with rugby, Nelson has scored its first ever All Blacks Test match. After spending more than a million dollars convincing the rugby union it was a serious host, here's Tracy Neal. It didn't take long for Nelsonians to react to the news that the city has been included in the All Blacks home test schedule next year. Oh, absolutely wonderful, fabulous. We will be there to get the tickets as soon as they're on sale. <laughs> Fantastic. I think it's the first time, about time, and I think it'll be great. I, I'm definitely going to go. Fantastic, mate. We need more of them. We deserve it. Let's go. Go, All Blacks. It's a, a good thing, I think, because um, the more provincial towns need to get a bit better view of what's going on, rather than it always being the big cities. Nelson's Economic Development Agency helped drive the bid that will see Trafalgar Park host the All Blacks test against Argentina on September the 8th next year. Chief Executive Mark Rawson says the rugby union initially thought it was joking when Nelson put up its hand. The response that we got from the rugby union, first of all, shall we say surprising and perhaps not, <laughs> not really taking us seriously, to be brutally honest. The pitch cost more than a million dollars with backing from the Tasman Rugby Union, three private sector investors and the Nelson City Council, which gave $300,000 through its events fund. Deputy Mayor Paul Matheson says it's likely that more money will have to be spent on upgrading Trafalgar Park over and above the millions it cost to bring it up to scratch for Rugby World Cup in 2011. It currently seats 18,000. We need to increase our seating capacity up to around 21,000. Uh, so that's going to require us to bring in obviously some temporary stuff and that's what uh, the rugby union is looking at. Yes, as always, money uh, has to be spent to, to get a return. But Nelson's gain is Christchurch's pain. The Canterbury Rugby Union says there are clear criteria for awarding all black tests and Christchurch needs to accept its facilities and infrastructure no longer meet that criteria. The Crusaders chief executive Hamish Reak says they're bitterly disappointed for the fans. We know Christchurch and Christchurch people, Canterbury people, love the All Blacks. They, they love big events uh, and for uh, this community not to... You know, not to see the All Blacks uh, play for a number of years um, is very, very disappointing. New Zealand Rugby has confirmed Christchurch won't be given a test in 2019 either. Back in Nelson, Paul Matheson says finding enough beds for the expected visitor influx could be a problem, but Blenheim, about 120 kilometres away, is expected to take the overflow. Frequently people come uh, and stay in Marlborough when we have Marcos games and vice versa. So depending on the type of accommodation, we will, we'll be able to yep, probably put up most of it. But no, they'll have to travel a little, a little way. Yep. Mr Rawson says they've banked on visitors making up about 40% of the expected crowd who will also be treated to a festival that was included in Nelson's pitch. And Nelson has other sporting fixtures in its sights. Next year, we're going to be able to have the All Blacks, the Black Cats, probably, if not next year, certainly in the next couple of years, the Silver Ferns. It's all about creating a world-class regional city in New Zealand that is attractive for people, for talent to live. In Nelson for Checkpoint, Tracy Neal. Auckland Transport is being challenged to use Te Reo Māori signage across its transport network. The Independent Māori Statutory Board says Auckland Transport needs to priority the use prioritise the use of Te Reo. Te Manu Korehi reporter John Boynton has more. Mr Taipari says he raised the issue at an Auckland Council Finance and Performance Committee meeting last week. For the last seven years, he says the Independent Māori Statutory Board has been calling for Te Reo Māori signage to be installed by Auckland Transport. My concern at the meeting was the length of time it was taking and the, the reasons behind that, so I questioned that at the committee meeting. He says the use of Te Reo Māori will bring both an economic and cultural boost to the Auckland region. We just think it's appropriate that Auckland Council and councils across the country recognise Te Reo Māori and its capacity as the official language of New Zealand. Mr Taipari is looking forward to reading AT's implementation strategies for Te Reo Māori use, which he says will be ready in September. In a statement, Auckland Transport says it's looking to develop and assess the cost of implementing Te Reo Māori signage. It says at this stage, no decision has been made. Te Moana Maiki from Te Arua grew up surrounded by her language and culture in Rotorua. There's Māori signs everywhere. You could tell that, you know, Rotorua is 
definitely the hub for Māori. She currently buses every day from the North Shore to Auckland University, where she is on an internship. Miss Mikey says AT should move towards embracing Māori language. Having things bilingual at the moment to start off with and getting people to get used to it would be awesome and kind of that way normalise into their Māori. Many of the commuters at Britomart in central Auckland agreed Te Reo Māori has an important role to play on public transport. Māori culture and the language is starting to you know, disappear and it's good to bring it back into New Zealand since this is the land of the Māori people. It's the first language that everyone spoke here before the English people came. For like international people coming to visit, it like, gives them an insight. Some people like to be able to recognise the Māori language and the English, you know what I mean? It, there should be a choice. A good idea, kapai and kia ora, nā koe. Four to three kings is scheduled to depart in ten minutes. Te hōtaka o te ahi nei, ko John Boynton aho. Coming up after six o'clock, we're speaking to Jacinda Adun on Labour's plans for Dunedin Hospital. RNZ News at six. Kia ora. Good evening. Ko Katrina Batanaho. A leading family doctor says a cap affecting the funding increase received by the Northland District Health Board is absurd. In a leaked letter yesterday, the DHB's chief executive, Nick Chamberlain, told staff the DHB is going without $29 million of funding. Dr Chamberlain said population growth means it should get a 6.6% funding boost under the population-based funding formula. However, he said there's a cap on the size of increase that's allowed, and Northland has only had a 4 to 5% rise for three years. Wellsford GP and President of the College of GPs, Tim Malloy, says he'd never heard of such a cap. The net result is a mismatch between the services required by the population of Northland and the amount of funding that's been applied. And this, I believe, is relatively unique to this particular district health board, which makes it again absurd. Dr Tim Malloy. The Labour Party says a public-private partnership didn't work for some of the country's prisons and shouldn't be used to build hospitals. Labour says if elected to government, it plans to build a new $1.4 billion Dunedin hospital, similar to the National Party's announcement on the weekend. However, Labour leader Jacinda Ardern says they wouldn't pay for the hospital by public-private partnership, but out of existing taxpayer funds. We've of course had examples of PPPs for prisons that have not worked in New Zealand. Why would we repeat that for something as important as a hospital? Jacinda Ardern says she's also confident Labour can build the hospital faster than National's 7-10 to 10 year estimation. The Ministry of Health is defending the development of a new healthcare centre in the West Coast's Buller District. The current 35-bed hospital is to be replaced with a 10-bed centre that will be owned by the Accident Compensation Corporation under a public-private partnership. Some residents say the funding model has driven the design of a shoebox-sized facility that's not fit for purpose. The Ministry of Health says many district health boards in New Zealand lease premises at commercial rates. The State Services Commission says it's satisfied the Treasury didn't breach political neutrality by allowing the use of a National Party slogan in a presentation this week. The phrase, delivering for New Zealanders, appeared during the Finance Minister's slideshow in the pre-election fiscal update. Commission rules require government departments to stay clear of party politics in the run-up to a general election. In a statement just released, the State Services Commissioner says the presentation was put together using a, tw a budget 2017 template which included the slogan. Peter Hughes says there was no intention to convey a political message. A Tongan publisher says the King's decision to dissolve Parliament is a setback for the country's long and fragile progress towards partial democracy. The decision marks the downfall of Akalisi Pohiva, a long-time democracy campaigner who became Prime Minister in 2014. But Kalafi Moala, who's been critical of Mr Pohiva, says the government has been marred by controversy and Parliament has been paralysed by infighting. Mr Moala says the King's move is a setback for democracy but reflects frustrations with the government. 
The Supreme Court in Thailand has issued an arrest warrant for the former Prime Minister Ying Lak Shinawat after she failed to show up for the verdict in her trial over a controversial rice subsidy scheme. Lawyers for Ms Ling Yuk, who's charged with negligence, say she was ill. The court has delayed the verdict to September the 27th from Bangkok. Here's the BBC's Jonathan Head. She's been charged over an extravagant rice subsidy scheme run by her administration. Prosecutors accused her of ignoring warnings about widespread corruption. She argued that the scheme was operated in good faith and that it lifted the living standards of millions of farmers. It is impossible, though, not to see a political dimension to this trial, given the military government's thinly disguised mission to weaken the Shinawat family's influence. Their party has won every election for the past two decades, and the military is now planning a carefully managed transition back to a form of democratic government. Jonathan Head in Bangkok. And Thailand's Deputy Prime Minister now says it's possible Ying Luck Shinawat has already fled the country. A Hastings man has appeared in court today charged with receiving $40,000 worth of stolen honey. The police say a shotgun and ammunition were also found during the arrest of the 41-year-old. The head of Apiculture New Zealand, Karen Koss, says honey and beehive theft is a growing problem and costing beekeepers millions of dollars. Honey is worth a lot of money and it's devastating when our beekeepers find their honey or their beehives are stolen. So this is a great result for us, a really good outcome and sends a clear message that the police are taking honey and beehive theft seriously. Karen Koss says beekeepers are working with the police to improve hive security. It's five past six. The sport and the Australian rugby coach Michael Checker says supporters would be within their rights if they don't give the Wallabies any hope against the All Blacks tomorrow. Bookmakers have installed Australia at the longest odds they've ever been heading into a clash against the world champions. Checker says few outside the team bubble think they have a chance. You know, it's up to us to make our own, write our own chapters if we want to change our attitude around. And you know, people would be justified to think that. Uh, like I've said before, only we can turn that around on the field. You know, we, can, we, we do lots of good stuff away from the field, but what counts is on the field for everybody. We know that. Michael Checker. Meanwhile, the All Blacks captain, Kieran Reid, is braced for more niggle from the Wallabies in a last-ditch attempt to keep the Bledisloe Cup series alive. Australia was beaten in the opener last year and took a physical approach into the second test. Reid believes they could bring more of the same in Dunedin tomorrow. Laurie Daly's tenure as New South Wales State of Origin coach is over after the state body decided not to renew his contract. The Blues have just won, have won just one series since Daly took over in 2013. Doping samples at next year's Commonwealth Games will be stored long term for future testing for the first time with organisers hoping it will act as a deterrent for drug cheats. It's part of a series of measures announced in a partnership designed to protect clean athletes and the integrity of the Games. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, a musical mixtape from Bill Manhire. The perfect way to see out National Poetry Day. Country Life meets Gusta Pietsch who was a girl in Holland, dreamed of becoming a shepherd in New Zealand. 80 years later, she tells her story, and we have a sonic tonic dedicated to the songs and sound bites of ladders, stairs, escalators, elevators, on nights, because the only way is up, with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Coromandel Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. Cloudy periods and a few showers. Auckland to Taranaki, including Taumaranui and Taupo. Mainly fine, a few showers tomorrow, but clearing Auckland in the afternoon. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa, also Whanganui and Taihepe to Wellington. Fine, apart from some cloud about Wellington and Kapiti at times. Nelson and Buller, cloudy periods and the odd shower. Westland, cloudy showers, oh, scattered showers, turning to rain tomorrow morning, then clearing north of Hokitika in the evening. Uh, Marlborough, Canterbury, North Otago and Dunedin, fine with high cloud. Central Otago, Clutha and Southland, often cloudy with light rain at times. Fiordland, rain heavy at times. And the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. It's eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you, Katrina. Hundreds of people greeted Jacinda Ardern in Dunedin today as she pledged that the city would get a new $1.4 billion hospital in the first term of a Labour government. 
National has promised to rebuild Dunedin Hospital within seven to ten years, possibly through a public-private partnership. But Mr Dern says building Dunedin's new hospital with a public-private partnership will only delay the project. Yeah, the commitment we've made is yes, we would like to start the build in our first term. The promise was made um, that this work would begin back in 2014. It hasn't. Um, we now have a situation with Dunedin Hospital where operations are cancelled essentially when it rains because of leaking. It is urgent work. There are many reasons why we are opposed to a PPP, uh, one of which is we've seen examples abroad where hospitals built under a PPP, particularly in the UK, have led to blowouts and poor service. We've even got examples in New Zealand. Our view is it would also de delay the delivery of the hospital, which is absolutely critical for Dunedin. So it'll all be publicly funded, and how quickly will it be built and be open? Look, our expectation is that it would be uh, that we would start in our first term, uh, and then our expectation, based on what we've seen of other similar projects, they've tended to be built, you know, within you know five to six years. Uh, we, of course, once we develop up the plan, we'll have a firmer timeline. But our view is that it certainly can be delivered earlier than ten years. Why so urgent? I mean, you've been on a tour of the hospital today. What have you seen that you think it needs to be? done so quickly? Well, of course, other than the fact that we have uh, surgeries been cancelled because of the leaks in the building, there's also the fact that um, uh, maintenance has been delayed because it's been called uneconomic to continue with the maintenance program. And there's even questions about seismic risk. There's a range of reasons it needs to be fixed. Look, from what I saw today, there's exceptional service being provided by staff. But um, the plea is just making sure they've got a hospital that is fit for purpose and can deliver for the 300,000 people who in this region rely on their hospital. Did you go through the emergency department because we've had reports that it's absolutely chocker? Yeah, certainly the ward that I visit, visited today was um, full, um, but uh, uh, we of course wanted to make sure we didn't cause too much disruption to the work that the professionals are trying to do there, but certainly, certainly um, appeared from what I thought would be pretty full. And your plans for building it where? Not, not the Waikari site? Yes, no, we've, we've said not the Waikari site. Um, it, is, um, it is out of the city. Our view is that uh, the commitment to a central city site really is critical. Uh, a collaborative project that allows the university to still use the hospital uh, in the way that it, it's able to now will be key to it being continuing to a place of learning uh, and uh, uh, hopefully, as we've seen with the dental school world leading, you know, when I visited the hospital today, the number of students who came and talked to me while I was there, it's it's clearly very, very linked to the university and a central city site is, is key to maintaining that. So any thoughts on where that site would be? I mean, I think there's talk of taking over the old uh, Cadbury factory site. But there's, there's been talk about a range of sites. We wouldn't want to. We wouldn't want to uh, get too far ahead of ourselves in case we uh, reveal too much. When well, obviously we're going to be in a position of having to negotiate down the track. But the government's already indicated that their view would be a central city site would be preferable. They haven't ruled out though going out of um, the city. That indicates to us that there's certainly a range of options that are on the table and very, very viable. So National is saying it could build the hospital within seven to ten years. You are saying that it could be built sooner. Our view is sooner. Our view is that from what we understand of the project, that the PPP is potentially a considerable part of the delay. The amount of contractual work um, and the contracting process around uh, that kind of uh, um, set up uh, certainly would only delay the project. We believe we can shorten the time both by committing to doing it earlier but also changing uh, the nature of the project. And that's the Labour leader Jacinda Ardern. In a bizarre mystery, the US State Department has confirmed that at least 16 embassy staff in the Cuban capital of Havana have now reported suffering health problems after a series of possible acoustic or audio attacks. The Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has described the incident as a health attack against American staff in which some sort of mysterious sonic weapon was used. Is CNN's State Department correspondent Michelle Kazan the symptoms started being reported in November by at least 16 American diplomats and family members in Cuba, according to the State Department, at a time when relations had been thawing and long-standing harassment of U.S. diplomats there had stopped. There was nausea, dizziness, headaches, 
but also permanent hearing loss and perhaps most alarming, mild traumatic brain injuries, concussions. U.S. officials tell CNN they believe a sophisticated device operating outside the range of human hearing could have been placed inside or outside the diplomats' homes. A sonic weapon? Sound waves to incapacitate people are used today. LRAD is a technology that directs high decibel sound at people, making them feel dizzy and sick. It's used as crowd control in Israel and the U.S. It's used on ships to deter pirates, but that's audible sound. In the Cuba incidents, some diplomats did report hearing loud noises like a screech or buzz at times. That could be very similar to an LRAD, which can also be small and easy to move. But in other cases, no unusual sounds reported. Woodrow Wilson Center fellow Sharon Weinberger wrote The Imagineers of War on U.S. weapons research that has included sound beyond the range of hearing. The problem that the um, you know that you find in the literature, the published literature on this, is when they've tested weapons. You know, a, an acoustic, uh, an acoustic bazooka is one that they tested. It doesn't have the same effects on well, in this case, on animals. So it's not an effective weapon in that sense. People can be badly harmed though by both powerful low and high frequency sound waves that you can't hear, with effects similar to what the diplomats experienced. So you don't know. Uh, whether you're how long you've been hearing it or uh, how loud these noises are and then if you get constant exposure to these noises you're going to have permanent damage in your ear as well as in your brain there are no known weaponized uses of these frequencies that are out of the range of human hearing and there are reasons for that if you wanted to use very low frequency you'd likely need to have something really big and that's not very stealthy to produce that sound if it was something at very high frequency you could use existing technology but it would have to be directed right at the person with a clear shot of them and at very close range so that's causing some skepticism among several experts we talked to. They think that this is likely to have much more to do with listening devices or, or surveillance that is certainly being done on these diplomats there. CNN's Michelle Kaczynski from the U.S. State Department. Hurricane Harvey is expected to hit Texas as a Category 3 storm, the likes of which which haven't been seen since Hurricane Brett in 1999, when it makes landfall late tomorrow New Zealand time. The storm has strengthened to a hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 160 kilometres per hour and is moving northwest through the Gulf towards the Texas city of Corpus Christi. Forecasters say there could be storm surges of up to three metres, with waves of six metres above that, CNN's Kareen Kaifer reports. Warnings, preparations and evacuations along the Texas coast. As Hurricane Harvey moves closer. Bottle water, flashlights, generator. The White House said the president is monitoring the weather situation, and a message on his Twitter account Thursday urged those in the storm region to plan ahead. The president will weather the storm without a permanent head of Homeland Security. Former Secretary John Kelly is now his chief of staff. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders downplayed concerns about the administration's readiness, expressed confidence in the department's acting secretary, and said Kelly's new role will be an asset. I think that uh, we are in great shape having General Kelly sitting next to the president throughout this process, and probably no better chief of staff for the president uh, during the hurricane season. Harvey's powerful winds are a major concern, as is flooding. Harvey has been churning toward Texas at a slow speed speed, boosting potential rainfall totals. The storm could also bring heavy rain to eastern Louisiana, including New Orleans. Five to ten inches of rain uh, over the duration of the event uh, in our geographical location with potential for double, and this is what worries me the most, for double if we get stuck in prolonged rain bands. The last hurricane to hit the state was Ike in 2008, a storm that killed 21 people in Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Kareen Kaifer reporting. The Silver Ferns will be expecting the unexpected when they take to the court against South Africa in Brisbane tomorrow night for the first round of Netball's Quad Series. New Zealand demolished the Spa Proteas 70-39 earlier this year, but coach Janine Southby says they can be an unorthodox side and she's taken nothing for granted. Joanna McKenzie reports. 
The last quad series in January and February began with a loss to Australia, which meant no matter how well the Silver Ferns did against England and South Africa, they came second overall. This series, the draw has been kinder to New Zealand, with Saturday's opener against the Spa Pro Tears, followed by England on Wednesday and then the Diamonds next Sunday. But coach Janine Southby doesn't see it that way. The draw is the draw. I don't ever stress too much about these things. We've got to play them all at some stage and I, I don't ever think anyone's an easy beat or a hard beat. It's just the opposition you've got to face on that day. So we'll just take one game at a time and South Africa's first and foremost in our mind on Saturday. Southby knows the pro tiers have good skills, but the question is whether they can last the distance. Until you see them and get out on court, you don't know what changes they'll bring, but certainly from what we've observed, you know, the players have certainly got the capabilities, they're, they're skilled players, um, and I think for them it's going to be about putting their, those capabilities out there for a full game. Captain Katrina Grant agrees that South Africa's fitness and endurance has let them down in the past, but she knows they'll have been working on that. They always keep up for at least you know half to three quarters of a game and then just slip off. But with Norma Plummer there as their coach, um, I think they would have definitely addressed that. So this is going to be a pretty strong South African side, and you know it's going to be interesting going into it because we wouldn't have seen them. So it's going to be one of those games where you don't really know what you're going to get until you get on the court. Grant says there's a lot of competition within the squad for positions ahead of next year's Commonwealth Games and that's what's keeping them fresh. Taking one game at a time really, getting everyone on court as much as possible. As we know, um, Quad Series and Tony Jameson, we've got two different teams going through so it's kind of everyone's still on trial wanting to go in Con Cup but you know, first test match for this squad, I think this squad does feel a lot different to what we were doing in January um, but I feel like this is the, the key group that's going to go forward to Con Games. And while they're focusing on each game at a time, Grant says they still have one eye on their nemesis Australia and particularly Caitlin Bassett. It's pretty hard to stop um, and in the past we haven't been able to do that but this new defensive line is, um, is pretty special. It's got something different. Everyone brings something completely different. So no matter what, whoever they put on at goal attack to help Bassett, we've got other defenders who can come on and combat whatever we need to. The quad series kicks off tomorrow at five between England and Australia followed straight after by the Silver Ferns clash with the Pro Tears. For Checkpoint, called Joanna Mackenzie Ho. The United Kingdom has seen a sharp fall in net migration in the wake of last year's Brexit vote. The number of people moving to Britain, minus those leaving the nation, has fallen by a quarter. A driver of the fall is an exodus of Europeans, many of whom no longer feel welcome in post-Brexit UK. The drop has created problems for some businesses that have come to rely on European workers. The ABC's Nick Dole reports from London. Cafe owner Bronte Oral never used to have much trouble attracting workers to her business in West London, but she says Brexit created a sense of uncertainty that's keeping some potential staff away. And because of Brexit, what will happen next year, what will happen the year after? You know, they want some form of security and knowledge that they are allowed to stay and work in the country that they're choosing to go to. Net migration is the difference between the number of people entering a country and those leaving it. The latest UK figures show it fell by 81,000 in the 12 months to March. Paul Vickers is from the Office of National Statistics. Since the EU referendum, we've seen falls in net migration for EU citizens and in particular those for Eastern European and that's been driven by emigration of Eastern European um, citizens who are returning for work. Brexit's by no means the only factor. Analysts say the falling value of the pound is also a potential cause. But Romanian worker Daniel Catlin says after Britain voted to exit the European Union, he doesn't feel welcome, so he's leaving. Uh, I think they are like a little bit racist with us, with the European people. Yeah, for that reason. It may have fallen, but net migration is still a quarter of a million, more than twice the government's target of 100,000. Brandon Lewis is the immigration minister. He says overseas workers do play a vital role. He just wants to see fewer of them. We can't be complacent. We won't be complacent. There's still a lot of work to do, and we'll continue to do that work to deliver ultimately on that long-term ambition to see net migration fall to sustainable levels. 
But Labor leader Jeremy Corbyn says it's the reduction in immigration that's unsustainable and it's hurting sectors like the health system. The NHS, particularly in parts of England, are facing problems of nurse recruitment because of the reduction in the number of EU citizens coming. So what we have to do is have stability in it and we have to have migration based on the economic needs of the UK. Net migration may be falling, but there are plenty of people making homes for themselves here. There's still twice as many EU nationals coming to Britain as there are leaving. And that's Nick Doll reporting. Australia has been named as the regional guard dog of the United States of America in the most recent ISIS propaganda video. The film also calls on Muslims in Southeast Asia to join the terror group. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has warned nations must assist the Philippines to ensure Marawi doesn't become the wrecker of Southeast Asia. The ABC's Stephanie Boris reports. The images are disturbing, gruesome and upsetting. Dead bodies lying across the ground, militants setting fire to a church, stamping on statues, ripping up photos of the Pope. The latest ISIS video calls on Muslims from across Southeast Asia to join the battle in the southern Philippines. It also takes aim at the country's president, Rodrigo Duterte, for accepting help from Western nations. Duterte ran to his mass the defenders of the cross, America, along with their regional guard dog, Australia, and begged them for help. And despite having been previously insulted by Duterte, they were quick to put their differences aside, aiding him with a malicious air campaign with the hope of either achieving victory over the Islamic State or repelling its threat. Greg Feely is the Associate Professor of Southeast Asian Politics at the Australian National University. He says the release of another propaganda video shouldn't come as a surprise, but it's interesting to note who they're targeting. In this most recent video, they're referring explicitly to Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, um, Singapore and Brunei. Uh, so that's quite specifically targeted. Nations from across the globe have focused fighting ISIS in the Middle East, but the terror group has gained ground in the city of Marawi in the southern Philippines. Greg Feely explains why it's emerging as a key site for ISIS activity in Southeast Asia. There is much less control in this island of Mindanao of the population, much less effective military and police control than what there is in most other parts of Southeast Asia. So, for example, in Indonesia and Malaysia, it would be almost impossible for a jihadist group such as we have in Marawi to have a jihadist group like that holding on to territory, being able to hold part of a major city, which is what's happening in the southern Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of locals have fled the city since fighting began earlier this year. As a result of growing tension, the Philippines accepted Australia's offer in June to send two defence aircraft. They're providing surveillance support to the nation's armed forces. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull told Melbourne Radio 3AW Australia has a vested interest in assisting. We do not want um, Marawi to become the, um, you know, the racker of Southeast Asia. Greg Feely says that is a possibility, but he's warning nations to tread carefully in what assistance they provide. I think we should be extremely wary about having a military contribution there because that can provide PR material for ISIS and make it seem as if this is now a struggle between um, the supposed Christian West and these pro-ISIS forces. During a press conference, Mr Turnbull was asked about the prospect of boots on the ground. I don't uh, speculate on hypotheticals. We have, uh, we're already providing assistance to the Philippines and uh, will continue to provide the assistance that we currently have uh, deployed. The political situation in the Philippines is far from straightforward. President Duterte has been condemned across the globe for his inhumane war on drugs, which has killed thousands of people. It's a delicate balancing act. Western nations, including Australia, have called on the president to protect human rights, but at the same time they're working with him to try and stop ISIS gaining ground. Stephanie Boris reporting. The single biggest lottery jackpot winner in history has received her cheque for more than a billion New Zealand dollars and told of her shock at her newfound fortune. 
Mavis Wanzik, a 53-year-old American healthcare worker, was asked how she would celebrate and replied, laughing, I'm going to go and hide in my bed. Ms Wanzik has worked in the same medical centre in Massachusetts for 32 years and says she has already resigned from her job after fulfilling her pipe dream. The BBC's Davis, David Willis reports. Million dollars of get those tickets out. Let's play. That first number up tonight is seven. By the numbers that made a middle-aged hospital worker one of the richest people in the world. Mother of two, Mavis Wanzik, from Chicopee in Massachusetts, has since told her bosses she won't be at work tomorrow or the next day or any other day after that. Her $758 million prize is the largest single-ticket jackpot in American history. Last night it was kind of like I was, I didn't realize I won. Today, as I'm driving here, I'm still like, oh, this, this isn't true, this can't be. And then now it's like, uh, I, I am a winner and uh, I'm scared, but I'll be okay. U.S. lottery winners have the choice of taking the jackpot as a lump sum or a series of annual payments spread over the course of 29 years. Mavis, according to reports, has opted for the former, which even after paying an estimated $300 million in taxes, will still leave her wealthy beyond her wildest dreams. Another, more modest beneficiary is the convenience store where she bought the winning ticket. They're donating their $50,000 prize to charity. We just all happen to be the lucky people involved, that's all, and uh, we're glad to be able to pass it on. Mavis says she'd always dreamt of retiring early, and now that dream has come true. Immediate plans include paying off her car, but before that, she says she'll be hiding in her bed, trying to take in all the excitement. And that's David Willis reporting, and that is Checkpoint for this evening. Have a great weekend. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. A leading family doctor says a cap affecting the funding increase received by the Northland DHB is absurd. The Ministry of Health is defending the development of a new healthcare centre in the West Coast's Buller District. The State Services Commission says it's satisfied the Treasury didn't breach political neutrality by allowing the use of a National Party slogan in a presentation. And a Hastings man has appeared in court charged with receiving $40,000 worth of stolen honey. Our next news and weather is at 7. Country Life This Week is meeting a woman who came to New Zealand in 1951 to become a land girl. The cook, she was a dag, she used to get up at five, put a whole lot of big chops, break a dozen of eggs in there, shove the whole lot in the oven and go back to bed. At seven o'clock, you came in there and there was these hard-boiled eggs floating around the sheep's fat, you know. <laughs> but you ate.